Hello everyone, and welcome back. Today, we're going to continue from where we left off in the last lesson when we were talking about the Egyptian afterlife and we had gotten to the point where the soul goes up through the river of the sky through the 12 gates and they have to say the names of all the gods and goddesses or um, deities, major and minor deities. Once they say their names, they're able to pass through the gates and they finally make it to the Hall of Judgment. So that's what our lesson is going to be on today, is the Hall of Judgment. So, the Hall of Judgment is where the weighing of the heart takes place. And the weighing of the heart is kind of like your judgment day. Um, so we're going to go through all the different parts. So first, we're going to talk about the gods and goddesses that are directly involved in this process. Then next, we're going to talk about the 42 minor deities that you have to face before you're um, led into the room with the scale where Osiris is. So, then we'll talk about confession. So, you will confess kind of like your sins um, or what sins you have not done. Um, to these minor deities and then you'll be led into the hall of judgment where you will weigh your heart against the feather of Mott which is also the feather of truth and justice. There is a bird going absolutely crazy out there. It's just really excited about what we're talking about today. The last thing that we'll talk about is the field of reeds. And what someone would expect to find there um, after they passed the weighing test and then were accepted into Egyptian paradise. So, so let's start with the different gods and goddesses that are involved in this. So 
So the first god that we're going to talk about is Anubis. Anubis is the god that leads the soul into the hall to stand in front of Osiris. As we know from our gods and goddesses lesson, Anubis was the embalmer. He did mummifications. He was also thought to be protector of the dead. of graves. He obviously has the head of a jackal. And some believe that he represents like rebirth. Not just because he does embalming but because his skin is black. Which some believe the Egyptians um, thought that that was sacred because the soil that they would grow in their fields would be like black. I mean, really dark brown or black. So that was like a symbol. He represented rebirth and like good fortune. He's my favorite god. Anubis is so cool. And he looks cool. Let me show you. This is what he looked like. dress, black skin, like a jackal hat. I've always thought it's so funny the way they depict ancient Egyptians in movies and stuff because they're always portrayed as white people. And it's funny because like on their walls, the color of their skin is not white. I'm sure it's not exactly the same, but it's definitely not white, so I just think that's silly. Another reason that he has the head of a jackal is because jackals were known to scavenge, um, like dead animals and dead people. So the jackals would lurk around the cemeteries and the Egyptians hoped that you know, kind of like making the god Anubis a jackal, which I hate to say they just like made it up, but over time, they, this kind of like became, it's the original reason why he is the way he is. Um, he's a jackal because they thought that maybe he could keep the other jackals from eating the flesh of the people in the cemeteries and he would like be able to protect their dead loved ones and things like that. So Anubis's other task and some believe it is the most important. So Anubis is very very important. He has a lot of important duties, tasks that he has to perform. He's in charge of making sure every person is embalmed correctly so that their soul can make it up to the river and through the gates. He's also in charge of actually weighing your heart on the scale against the feather. kind of like the keeper 
or user of the scale. So, this is extremely important. So this is kind of cool because he's involved. He's, they kind of believed that he was like the symbol of life to death, to death. He embalms you and then also of death to life. because he also represents the soil that the crops will grow in and that's bringing new life into the world. So he's really cool, really important, and super smart. So. This is weird. When I was like a kid, I kind of had like a crush on Anubis. Is that, I mean, to me, that just seems like a psychotic, you know? So next, we're gonna talk about Mott. Mott was the goddess of truth. And justice. She also represented balance, which makes sense because her feathers weighed on the scale and order. So, um, kind of like the rules, like if you lived your life right, she cares about that. She's usually depicted with an ostrich feather. And sometimes wings. She's often like crouched. Sometimes she's standing. Mott was one of the, as we know from the creation myth, she rose from the waters of Ra. She was created when Ra rose from the waters. And it's like the waters of creation because it was, they believe it was all just kind of like water. Some consider her Ra's daughter. And many believe that she was married to Thoth. Who we will talk about but he's the ibis and he can also be a baboon in the hall of judgment he's an ibis headed so he's like a bird here's a picture of mott beautiful so her skin is this color because they believed a lot of the gods had golden skin and they actually believed that Osiris had green skin, which represented like fertility and like growth and birth. So, isn't she pretty? It's her wings and the ostrich feather that she'll use on the scale. So Mott's a really interesting Egyptian figure because when we talk about balance, Mott was considered to kind of like keep the universe together. So she kept the balance that kept the universe from like breaking, which is so insane to me because this is very much like kind of concepts, theoretical physics, when it talks about like the multiverse and there's a lot of people that think that um, there actually isn't balance in the universe. 
and that it could like cease to exist at any moment, but others believe that there is balance. And this is like scientific. Um, and that balance keeps the universe from like breaking apart. And that's exactly what Mock does, which is just like, I wish I could go back to ancient Egypt. We all do, but I'd probably die <laughs> in the first like couple days because, you know, I live here. Um, but so fascinating. So this also had to do with like morality, that kind of balance as well, which is why the the 42 minor deities are also called the assessors. Yep. Of Mott. So, this directly ties in with morality because you actually, this is called, you have to do what's called like a negative confession. And all these 42 minor deities have a specific, like almost like sin that you have to tell them that you have not committed. So you've done this right or you've done that right, and we'll go through those in a little bit. They're actually technically the first step, um, and one of the major steps in getting into the field of reeds, because they will consult with Osiris at the end before the decision is made when the weighing of the heart is being done. They will also take into consideration things that you say um, your confession and, you know, there are like circumstances. They'll just like, you know, it's almost like a, like a court system or something. Pretty interesting. Her feather is used on one side of the scale and then on the other side is your heart. And this is why the heart was left in the body when the body was mummified. They needed to weigh that heart when they got to the Hall of Judgment. So it all ties in together. So because Mott has to do with the balance of the universe, keep the very fabric, she keeps it together, and the morality of humans, she kind of bridges the gap between the mortal and the immortal. So she's very much involved in both. Egyptians also believe she predicts the flooding of the Nile. Which is directly involved with life, like very much um, rebirth, the giving of life, things like that. When a pharaoh became a pharaoh, or all pharaohs, um, I'm just going to put it over here, they became known as, can you see it? Hmm. I'll put it over here. They became known as the chosen of Mott. And this is because they believe that she chose them to be the pharaoh and that they now have kind of like free reign to govern over their land because she has given them permission to do so. So one really interesting word is the word is isfet. This word means chaos, so people believe that if Mott did not exist, the world would fall into Isfet chaos, and the cosmos would cease to exist, and humanity would cease to exist. 
And this is part of the reason that she's so important to pharaohs and why they have such a connection. She chooses them. And a lot of pharaohs um, made regular ritual offerings to Mott. And that makes sense because they're like, hey, thanks for making me pharaoh. Also, please keep the universe together. Here you go. So, you know, makes sense to me. She's so cool. I've actually learned a lot about her that I didn't know. I feel like since I went to college, which was 10 years ago, I have two degrees and that was my first one. Um, so much more has come out about like people have discovered a lot more and been able to translate more ancient Egyptian since I was in college. Next, we're going to talk about Thoth. As we've said before, he has the head of an ibis or a baboon. He was usually depicted as a human form with an ibis as a head. That's the way he's depicted in the um, scrolls, like the Book of the Dead, which is actually called the Book of Going Forth by Day. I think it's the more like accurate way to say it. So he was really like intellectual. He was very artistic. And he was a scribe. Which makes sense. He's like a writer. <laughs> um, so he was the god of the moon. He was the god of reckoning, learning, writing. He was the first scribe and the inventor of the Egyptian language and writing. an interpreter and an advisor to the gods so he was very, he was like a very good friend you know very very smart very creative I mean I mean, really, he's described as, like, an artist, of how we would describe artists today. So, his scribe duties were shared with Seshat. Is that how you spell that? Yeah. And, um, she was also responsible for, like, writing. So she had a lot to do also with writing. So, in mythology, Seth is very, very important. I don't know if we've talked about this all the way, but there's a legend where, um, you know, Nephthys is married to Seth, and Osiris is married to Isis, and they're all siblings, and Seth gets mad, kills Osiris, cuts his body up into pieces, spreads them around Egypt, and then Isis puts them back together and has sex with his dead body. Um, and Horus is born. And then Horus goes back to Seth and tries to like regain the throne to avenge his father. And Seth like cuts out his eye. So you hear a lot about the eye of Horus. That's what that represents. And Thoth actually was the one who protected Isis when she was pregnant with Horus. And he also was the one who healed Horus's eye.
It's my favorite legend in Egypt. It's one of the more well-known ones, but it's like so wild, you know? So, Hermopolis was where the polis is where the cult of Thoth existed when he was alive. So, Hermopolis is a real place and they have literally found millions of mummified Ibis and baboon baboons in this place. So it's a very sacred city to him and they kept that going for a long time for them to have to have mummified millions. Thoth was also known as the keeper of magic. I swear the coolest gods are in the Hall of Judgment. They're so... They're all so cool. And of course, Thoth and Mott are married. Come on. They're both amazing. Many think of him as the closest god to Ra. He's... Um, some think he was born from the lips of Ra. when he first opened his mouth to speak. And there are others who believe that he was almost like the creator of the universe. So he came into existence as an ibis. And laid a giant egg. Or a cosmic, cosmic egg that holds all creation, all life and creation. He also invented the calendar. So he's just like the smartest god, it seems like. So in the Hall of Judgment, Thoth stood by the wall and he recorded the results of the weighing. Oh my gosh. And he also consulted with the 42 and Osiris when the decision was being made up after the weighing, he was considered like a bookkeeper. Oh, the let this this legend when he was born from the lips of Ra, I just thought it was interesting. His name was called the God Without a Mother. Kind of sad. Seems like he turned out okay though. So the last god we're gonna talk about is the most important one, Osiris. Osiris is the ruler of the underworld. And he's the one you have to get past to get into the field of reeds. He was also thought as the god of fertility. And this has to do with his green skin. So he had green skin. And in a lot of his depictions, he does. I forgot Thoth. Here's the picture of Thoth. Scribin. This is Amit, leopard, hippopotamus, and crocodile. He's the one that eats your soul if you've been bad. 
and you're lost for all eternity, so it's not like great, you know. Not my fave. This is a picture of Osiris. His green skin. He's on his like little throne thing. I kind of just wanted to show you a picture really quick. This is what the Hall of Judgment looked like. So here's Osiris. Here's Mott with her feather. Here's Thoth. That's Amit. That's Anubis when he's weighing. This is Anubis when he's leading you in. And these represent the 42 minor deities. So really interesting. He's also associated with rebirth. And this is quite literal. He died and Isis put him back together and he was like reborn in the underworld, kind of. And so he is considered the first person God to be mummified and go through that process, which is really, really interesting. I could stay up hours every night thinking about this kind of stuff. It's just so, like, crazy interesting to me. So we talked about before, he is known as part of the divine family His mother was Nut, the sky. His father was Geb, which is the earth. And then he also has a brother and two sisters, Isis. And Nef. Um, as we also know, he married Isis, and they had a son who is Horus. And he is often depicted as a person with a falcon head. In that picture we just looked at, it looked like Horus was in the Hall of Judgment. Um, he's not... I mean, he's there sometimes, and then sometimes he's not, but he's not really, I don't know, I haven't, like, read a lot about him being, like, really important in the weighing of the heart process, so I think some people think he, like, introduces the person to Osiris, so if it makes sense, he's his son. So Osiris was considered a kind and generous god um he had battles and he like i mean all of them like murdered people and like poisoned people and <laughs> but when it comes to like their disposition they they often like to describe like the different gods which i think is great um kind generous he doesn't take like he's not doesn't care as much about vengeance. He was also considered the god of agriculture. This is because he's of his, the whole concept of like rebirth. And the Nile flooding also represents rebirth and new life, and he's connected with the Nile. There are many debates about this, but a lot of Egyptologists say his name either means I or the 
grown. Almost forgot. So he was, while he was alive, considered the first king of Egypt. So the first pharaoh. Oh my god. That word is so hard. Pharaoh. So him being the first pharaoh has a lot to do with his disposition. He was a very kind, generous pharaoh. He invented agriculture, which obviously is a huge thing for any civilization. They could grow their own crops. They didn't have to move around. The Nile was right there. They could stay. That was huge. Um... So he was considered an amazing pharaoh. People loved him, worshipped him, and um, he remained pharaoh until his brother Seth killed him. And then he was the first person mummified. He was the first person in the underworld, and then now is down there judging people. <laughs> Seth, too, this whole story about Seth killing him, he like lures him. He gets this elaborate chest takes it to Osiris and lures him to the chest and then locks him in the chest and takes him away. So he's very, he's very trusting, let's say. So there's actually another mythology that has to do with Osiris and Anubis. Many scholars and anthropologists believe that translations say that Osiris was tricked into sleeping with his other sister, Nephthys, because she changed herself to, into looking like Isis and then had sex with her brother Osiris and that's how Anubis came to be. So Anubis is like his son there's also another mythology where Anubis kind of secedes the throne to Osiris and people think that may be why because he was he showed great respect for Osiris he honored him he loved him and so he wasn't trying to like do anything crazy like a certain someone this guy right here this guy's nuts so this is really interesting people Egyptians worshipped him for thousands of years. It reminds me of Jesus, actually, like Christianity. So they had two festivals during the year, and these could be translated in different ways, I'm sure. One of them was called the Fall of the Nile. And this is when Osiris was killed. They also celebrate something called the Jed Pillar Festival. Again, these could probably be translated in different ways. That's not how you spell festival. And this was in remembrance of his Resurrection and when he descended to the underworld. Okay. Okay. So we've talked about all the main gods that are involved that are like important to the process. Which is like half of the Hall of Judgment. <laughs> okay, so let's move on to the 42 Divine Judges. or the assessors 
of Mott. So this is like a confession. The Book of the Dead actually tells you how to address each judge and what to say to kind of like pass their test. Out of these 42 divine judges, there were nine great judges. These were Ra, Shu, Tefnut, Gab, Nut, Isis, Nephthys, Horus, and Hathor. So we've actually talked about all of these in the Gods and Goddesses lesson, but just as a reminder, Ra is the sun, supreme god. Shu is the god of air and peace. Tefnut is the goddess of moisture. Geb is the earth. Nut is the sky. Isis, she's the goddess of life, magic, fertility. Nephthys is the goddess of the dead. Um, Horus is the god of the sun and sky, and Hathor is the goddess of love, fertility, and joy. They have a lot of crossover. So the other judges were often depicted as awe-inspiring beings that were known to be like terrible beings. Not all of them were like this. Um, but if you're being judged and you've done like terrible things in your life, these are the people who are going to kind of like come out and they're going to judge the crap out of you. Some of the names of these types of judges were Crusher of Bones, Eater of Entrails, Double Lion, Stinking Face, which we talked about in the last one, and Eater of Shades. Those are just a few. So this is where the negative confession comes in. So this is a defense. It's like defending your life to be considered worthy. I wonder if this scale is ever like even and they have to like decide <laughs> whether you make it or not by like your confession and stuff. Scary. The Papyrus of Ani is a good example. Why am I writing in caps? I don't know. <laughs> Each confession would be catered to like what you did in your life. So like scribes would have different confessions than like a merchant. And like a soldier wouldn't have the same confessions because you know, they, they did like different things. But each of these negative confessions have 42 confessions. Specifically for each deity. 
So there's a specific thing that you say for each different 42 of the deities, and these are all written in funerary texts. So funerary texts are like the Book of the Dead, Papyrus of Ani, and like pyramid texts are what are written on the walls of the pyramid, obviously. But they talk about pyramid and funerary texts quite a bit if you research Egypt. These were often, the thing, the confessions, were often called the 42 laws of Mott. So these are like the moral principles that she thinks that you should live by. They're pretty standard. Makes sense to me. These are not only called negative confessions. They were also called Declarations of Innocence because if you haven't done anything wrong then you don't have to have negative confessions, right? So obviously there's 42 of these so I'm not going to write them all out but I will read them to you. So the first law that you're going to address or confess to or declare your innocence to is sin. I have not committed sin. Number two, I have not committed robbery or violence. Number three, I have not stolen. Number four, I have not slain men and women. Number five, I have not stolen food. Number six, I have not swindled offerings. Number seven, I have not stolen from the gods or goddesses. Number eight, I have not told lies. Number nine, I have not carried away food. I don't know what that means. Number ten, I have not cursed. Like bad words, because I'd be out. <laughs> Number eleven, I have not closed my ears to truth. Number twelve, I have not committed adultery. Number 13, I have not made anyone cry. Oh, that's a tough one though. What about cry with joy? A relief or something, okay. Number 14, I have not felt sorrow without reason. What if you're depressed? These are intense. Number 15, I have not assaulted anyone. Number 16, I am not deceitful. 17, I have not stolen anyone's land. 18, I have not been an eavesdropper. 19, I have not falsely accused anyone. 20, I have not been angry without reason. 21, I have not seduced anyone's wife. What if you're a lady? Hmm. 22, I have not polluted myself drugs or something. I have not terrorized anyone. <laughs> Number 24, I have not disobeyed the law. 25, I have not been exclusively angry. These all must have like very specific meanings that we just like don't understand because it's ancient Egypt. 26, I have not cursed the gods or goddesses. 27, I have not behaved with violence. 28, I have not caused disruption of peace. 29, I have not acted hastily or without thought. 30, I have not overstepped my boundaries of concern. 31, I have not exaggerated my words when speaking. Again, be out. 32, I have not worked evil. 33, I have not used evil thoughts, words, or deeds. 34, I have not polluted the water. It's 
my favorite one so far. 35, I have not spoken air angrily or arrogantly. I wish we had that rule. 36, I have not cursed anyone in thought, words, or deeds. 37, I have not placed myself on a pedestal. <laughs> 38, I have not stolen what belongs to the gods and goddesses, which is similar to several others. 39, I have not stolen from or disrespected the deceased. 40, I have not taken food from a child. Well, I would hope so. 41, I have not acted with insolence. 42, I have not destroyed pop property belonging to the gods and goddesses. So there's a lot of like, where you have jerked the gods and goddesses. I don't know why you would be if you wanted to get into the field of reeds, but it makes sense that they would be like, there's like the scary ones. Those ones are coming after you. So here's a picture. A little bit in more depth. Kind of a different like layout of what's going on. Here's the person talking to Osiris. Here's Anubis weighing the heart. There's Amit. He's getting ready to eat Joe. There's the feather of truth and justice. And there's stuff, and he's, you know, writing stuff down. And then there's all these guys. And they're just looking at you, judging you. It's like the judge, the person who transcribes the court, I can't remember what they're called, the person who like writes in court, it's like the bailiff, <laughs> a lawyer, and this is the jury. It's actually kind of weird. So after all this, there's something called the tribunal of Osiris. And that's when everyone comes together and they talk about what you said and they're like, you know, like, are they good enough to hang out with us or not? So now we've come to the weighing of the heart. Probably the most well-known part of this ritual. Very fascinating, that's why. So, Ib is your heart, which will be on one side of the scale, and on the other side, the feather of truth and justice. People also say Ab. So, it can be either one. It begins by, after the 42, Anubis greets you and guides you into the hall and Osiris. There is the scale, there is a throne with Osiris sitting on it with his green skin and his um, throne like hat crown of Upper and Lower Egypt. Thoth would be standing there. Next to Osiris, uh, 
and he would be ready to consult and also write down what the results of the scale was and then a giant golden scale in front of you. So also in this room would be Mott and the 42 deities representing the 42 like commandments kind of that they have like Egyptian commandments so some believe that um, the confessions are done here and some believe that they're done before they even walk into the hall but sometimes they're done right here in this you walk in you see the scale you see Osiris and Thoth and you see Mott and the 42 deities and you start your confessions and what you say I have not learned the things that are not and what that means is the soul strove to devote itself to matters of lasting importance instead of trivial matters and problems in everyday life. So that's kind of where you start. You start that and then you, you know, depending on if you're a soldier, a merchant, a baker, a scribe, You know, those would all, they would all start with their different negative confessions. As they were giving these confessions, they would all, they would often state many times, I am pure. Trying to convince them that they lived a life worthy of the field of reeds. After this, the heart is handed to Osiris. who places it on the scale. On the other side is the feather of Mott. So this will know if what you said the feather will be able to determine if what you said was true and if you can justly move on into the Egyptian afterlife. So, if this happens and your heart weighs less than the feather, then Osiris will consult with the deities and Thoth. And they will decide whether you are worthy of going into the field of reeds. It would be a real bummer if your heart weighed less and then they just still decided they didn't want you to go. So what happens if your heart is heavier? If your heart outweighs the feather, then it was thrown to the floor to be devoured by the beast vomit. As we saw before, it was leopard, hippopotamus, and crocodile. I think there are different variations to what animals he can be, or she. I believe it's a female. And so this is where existence would end for you. If you lived a bad life, you didn't get a second chance. Um, Amit ate your heart. There was no hell. You just ceased to exist anymore. You're gone. Egyptians considered this a fate far worse than death. 
and that was non-existence. Interesting that that's what they feared the most. That's what people struggled have struggled with for thousands of years, but we struggle with this a lot today. Um, it was easier to explain it with religion in ancient times because there were no scientific explanations. I think it would be so amazing to not know any science and believe that this is real. It would be really scary, but still pretty cool, you know, magical. So the last thing that we're going to talk about today is the Egyptian paradise or the field of reeds. Here's something that was written by someone to describe how they feel about getting into Egyptian paradise. May I walk every day unceasing on the banks of my water. May my soul rest on the branches of the trees which I have planted. May I refresh myself in the shadow of my sycamore. People believed that the field of reeds was a place with no sorrow or suffering. However, you did a lot of the same things that you did in your regular life. So you could even have like your same exact house, all the trees you planted. I think that's like so, like it was important to them to have the trees that they planted in the afterlife. I just, I could go on and on. You could farm the same fields, drink beer, play games, take care of your animals. All the things that you love to do when you were alive. There are also things called shabti. I think they're called different things, but this is the word I was taught. And they're like mini figurines. You often see these right outside the coffin, um, kind of with the other goods that are laid in the tomb, and they're helpers. So the Shabti could plow your fields for you and do your chores for you and you can just hang out and relax. But I think they really enjoyed doing their chores and just living. So if you make it past and you're getting to go to the field of reeds, you are rowed across a lake called Lily Lake. And that's where you enter the eternal paradise. So to kind of end this lesson, I'm going to show you a picture of what they believed. This is just like a depiction of what someone kind of thought the afterlife would be like. Rich vegetation, farming, animals. There's someone on a boat. There's Ra. Here's, this is, those are the fields. Looks like they're mummifying someone. Which is, oh, maybe this is like, I don't know. Looks like they're taking someone's brains out of their nose. But this is supposed to be the field of reeds. Scholar Rosalie David describes the afterlife after much research as being described as this. It was believed to be a place of lush vegetation with eternal springtime, unfailing harvests, and no pain or suffering.
sometimes called the Field of Reeds. It was a mirror image of the cultivated area in Egypt where rich and poor alike were provided with plots of land on which they were expected to grow crops. The location of this kingdom was fixed either below the western horizon or on a group of islands in the west. Interesting. Actual location. So that's all I have for you today about the Hall of Judgment, the weighing of the heart, and Egyptian paradise. So I hope this was as fascinating for you as it was for me. If you enjoyed this video, keep an eye out for more because I'll be doing more Egyptian videos. And I think I'll actually start exploring the afterlife rituals of different civilizations because it's my favorite. So I hope everyone enjoyed this lesson, and I hope you have a really relaxing night or day, and I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye.